I feel that Jamaica gets overlooked. The expat movement among African Americans, Black Canadians, people from all over the world is really growing. They're looking for that place. There are many of us living here extremely happy. It's a 98.7% Black country. It's English speaking. It's not that far from America. I think the grill is a very good place to locate. So here I have the famous Seven Mile Beach. I have some of the top entertainers that come in town to do shows. I have lots of company coming. I'm never lonely. I didn't see myself in Jamaica stuck in the top of the Blue Mountains in a cabin. I saw myself in a social setting. That's in the grill. Hello, Throppers, and welcome back to another video podcast episode. And if this is your first time visiting, a special welcome to you. My name is Winthrop Wellington, and I'm the host of On Deck with Throp, where we have meaningful conversations with people from all over the world, all about Jamaica. And today we have an extremely special guest, someone who has been here before, and I'm very excited about our conversation. Who knows where it's going to go today? And it is my pleasure to welcome the one, the only Miss Misty Memphis to the podcast. Hi, well, thank you very much. Uh, before we go any further, I want to say thank you for the first one because it has worked miracles for me and for Capital Casual. Awesome. And um, people people say, oh, I know you. You're the lady from, oh, from Rob's podcast. <laughs> oh, man. No, that's awesome. That That's awesome. That really warms my heart. And like to me, like that's what this is really about is telling people stories that just I think are so important for other people to be heard, other people to hear. And uh, that's really why I want, why, how I want to use my platform more than anything else. Uh, so for those that don't know, Misty runs an incredible online Facebook group called the Capital of Casual, as well as a, another one that we will get into. But before we hop into that, okay. I don't want to assume that everybody has seen that podcast before. Right. And uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the audience. Okay, everyone, my name is Marilyn Williams. On the internet, I'm Misty Memphis. I'm a native of Memphis, Tennessee. And like everyone, I came to Jamaica on vacation in April of 2000. And it just changed everything. I couldn't get back here enough. I came as much as I could. Every chance I could steal a ticket and the money for it and the time I was here. And that morphed over into... Um, basically getting my permanent residency and then ending up living here. And I've been living here 13 years and extremely, extremely happy. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> and for those that don't know, why slash how did you choose Jamaica? I came to Jamaica. Oh, damn, you know I hate this. <laughs> I saw the movie How Stella Got Her Groove Back, but it was not the romance part. It was a scene in which they showed this slow-moving 360-degree view of the terrain and the, and the uh, country itself. And sitting in that little dark theater in Memphis, Tennessee, I said, I've got to go to that place. I have to go. It would be three years before I would finally make it happen, but I did come, and... Um, I've seen scenes that put that one to shame since. Mm -hmm. Because Jamaica is a, a geographically extremely blessed country. And some, some scenes you see here could actually bring you to tears. And I know on our last sit down, you had said that you would never be able to go there, but you have gone there. Yes, oh yeah. Recently. So in that, that scene I, I told you about, uh, Stella is trying to go to the pajama disco with Winston, and she holds the 90s up, and she says, I'm too old for this mess. And, and sorry, and to be clear, this is at Round Hill. <laughs> at Round Hill. Right. I, and and throws, the, throws the 90s on the bed and goes and sits on this ledge, looks out at the view, and they do this slow 360. And I said, not only did I say, I'm going to Jamaica, I said, I am going to find that room and I'm going to rent that room and I'm going to sit on that ledge and I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to look at that view until I found out that it was the Ralph Lauren suite and it's $5,000 or so a night. And I knew that that was not going to happen <laughs> in this lifetime. As a matter of fact, when I check prices in Round Hill in general, I, I just say I can't do that. But I bit the bullet recently and I did go 
And they wouldn't even let me in the Ralph Lauren suite oh, to, boy. The, to look. <laughs> I, I said, I just want to look at the ledge. I can't. I <laughs> thought maybe they would let me take a picture. They wouldn't let me in there. But I did get a suite that had a similar view. And I did get to sit on the ledge. And I caught a lady who was on her way to breakfast, minding her own business mm-hmm. with her husband, drug them into my room, and sat up on the ledge and did all these poses. And she took awesome. pictures. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. I'm glad you did that. That's wonderful. So it sounds like you had a good experience there. I did. Round Hill's beautiful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I loved it. It's beautiful. And I was going all over the place going, oh, that's where Stella and Winston stood when they did XYZ. And they took me on the Stella tour because they knew why I was coming. Okay. And they had a concierge to take me to all the spots where they shot scenes there. And and um, I didn't know that the famous bed scene, the bed never was in a bedroom. They hauled mm. it out on the veranda gotcha. for, for that for that shot, and and I was like, oh wow, <laughs> Hollywood, right? <Yeah. laughs> if you could let everybody know about your Facebook group, Capital of Casual, you had alluded to it uh, in the opening, and I think it's very important to reiterate what you're doing there and also its mission. So it's called Capital of Casual in the Grill, Jamaica. There's another one with a, a very similar name. So the one that that I have is 22,000 members and the background is pink. So you'll be sure to get the right one. Gotcha. And um, the goals are to get you to select out of all the places in the world that you could vacation. I want you to select Jamaica. And once selecting Jamaica, could we, could we land in Montego Bay or Kingston and then make the big trek over to Negril? Because mm-hmm. this is really the place to be. Think about it. One of the biggest uh, excursions that they offer you when you're staying in Montego Bay or Ocho Rios is a trip over to Negril to see the Seven Mile Beach and then go to Rick's Cafe at Sunset. That's right. So people come from all over the island to here anyway. So why not just stay here? And once they see the beach, I, I, I sit on the beach every day and watch, I call them the day trippers. Mm-hmm. I watch the day trippers come. And they look and they go, oh, did we ever mess up? <laughs> oh, did we ever make the wrong decision? Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't make it any better. If I can get engage them in conversation, I say, so next time, what, what, what have we learned today? You know, mm-hmm. I was a school teacher. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what have we learned today? That we should have stayed here in the first place. And next time, this is where we That's very good. Very mm-hmm. good. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. And I think the community that you've built with Capital of Casual is it's, it's large, but it's also very impactful. And I think you do a good job of, I would say, the, the types of conversations that take place and the information that you disseminate, not only yourself, but also your admins and the community members, I think, are really helpful for people who who have maybe never even been to Negril and never even been to Jamaica before. Well, what's important is after you make this decision to choose Jamaica and after you make this decision to choose Negril, once you get here, I want you to patronize Jamaican-owned and operated properties. Eat, sleep, play, Jamaican-owned and operated. If you do this, you keep the wealth within the community. Um, it's an a, a open industry and it's an international industry. And we don't want to uh, negate our international investors. They are indeed important. However, sometimes they tend to overshadow and take a great deal of business away from our Jamaican-owned and operated properties, like the one I'm sitting in right now, Travelers. Okay? So we have to um, advocate for them, and we have to make people aware that of their existence. And, and I have a list of everything, list of Jamaican-owned and operated restaurants, hotels, bars. And my, my members are well-oriented in patronizing Jamaican-owned and operated. We call it J-O-A-O. J-O-A-O, Jamaican-owned and operated. Gotcha. And that's our uh, motto on Capital of Casual. Additionally, we have a really strong community outreach and community service component. Can I talk about that for a minute? Yeah, absolutely, please. Okay. Um, during COVID, we found out that at Sablamar Hospital, 
unfortunately, they were reusing rubber gloves, uh, surgical gloves from one patient to the other because they just didn't have them. No, no. And the mask also. Uh, the uh, traffic was extremely limited here because of COVID, but, you know, diehard uh, Jamaica lovers, they're coming. So they they jumped through the hoops. They did the they did the uh, COVID testing. They got the authorization online. They did it, and and so here came the gloves and the mask, and we supplied South Lamar Hospital. So we saw to it that they weren't doing that from one patient to the other. Hmm. Um, one of my members could have gone back to the states to have her baby, but she chose to have her baby here in a public hospital. She was appalled when she saw mothers taking their babies home wrapped up in their t shirt and had nothing. Oh no. You know, and in the case of maybe a, a teenage girl that the parents aren't quite happy that she got pregnant mm-hmm. and had a baby. The babies that go out of that hospital now have complete layettes, thanks to my group. They they do not leave that they leave they leave that hospital with changes of clothes and awesome. all kinds of T shirts and receiving blankets and bottles and diapers and everything babies need. Um we buy whole chickens from a local farmer and then distribute them to people in need. Um, you know, a lot of families, they know chicken back, they know chicken foot, they know chicken this, but the, to get a whole chicken, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we we distribute those and we send some over to the St. Anthony Soup Kitchen sometimes, but uh, members pay, them, pay for them and then we distribute them within the community. Um, touchy subject, but... We found out that the girls in Belmont and Grange Hill uh, were using paper towels that special time of month. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen anymore. Mm-hmm. My group locked that down. That's awesome. And um, and then sometimes little girls have accidents at school mm-hmm. and they don't have a change of panties. That doesn't happen anymore. All of that's taken care of. Um, these kinds of things. Um, when when COVID shut the schools schools down and the kids had to go to electronic learning, of course every child had an electronic pad. Of course they did. <laughs> no, they did not. So along with Gail Big Jack, Jackson Brooks at Treehouse and, and, and some uh, returning Jamaican families were the most prominent ones that did this. And those pads are $120 or so a piece. We, we supplied hundreds of kids with those e-learning pads. And Rick's Cafe uh, supplied a lot of internet bandwidth space for those children. A lot of people don't know that. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, Rick's Cafe did. They stepped to the, they stepped to the plate on that one. They got an award for it, as a matter of fact. That's so tough. we gave them the pads. Rick supplied the, the um, internet. And so a lot of those kids were able to go to school. But this group is the kind of group that if a need comes up, and I just throw it out there. Hey, Jamaica needs X, Y, Z. Guess what? It's coming. That's awesome. And where would you say this, one, the advocacy for local-owned Jamaican businesses, and then also the philanthropic efforts that you that you engage in, where do you say that that, that comes from? Well, when a place has made you happy, and when a place has given you so much, and, and you feel fulfilled and you feel complete. You look around you and you see a need. It's just, it's like you want to just hug the whole country. It's, a, it's like a big hug. Mm-hmm. Like, what can I do to hug you? So, so you want to give back. Um, I want to speak about a certain hotel. Now, we, we talked about Jamaican owned and operated, mm-hmm. right? So there's a certain hotel called the Rock House. Yeah. And it is by no means Jamaican owned and operated. It's a conglomerate of guys from Australia, I believe, if, if I'm not wrong. Right. But they give back to this community so huge with the Rock House Foundation that they, they're all right with me, <laughs> you know? And then there's Mr. Um, Issa, mm-hmm. and he has a, a strong foundation. Now, Mr. Issa is Jamaican, mm-hmm. but... He has a really strong foundation. And then, of course, your family mm-hmm. has a very strong foundation and gives back. So you would be double, doubly liked by my group. 
But I, we just feel like if you're not Jamaican owned and operated, that you could give back to the community. And giving back is not, I employ Jamaican people. Mm -hmm. You can't run your business without employees. <laughs> right. That's not giving back. We're talking about giving back of your profits. Don't take all of your profits out of this country and don't give back. You took it from this country. And we kind of monitor that. And that's where my, my members like to stay and they like to support those places that give back to Jamaica in a real tangible way. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly on the organizations that you mentioned. Rock House, for sure. They're huge, Tremendous. like big part of this community in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And it's I, I feel sometimes almost their business is built around giving back. Obviously, they're a for profit business, but they also mm -hmm. have their nonprofit that does phenomenal work um, throughout, even outside of Negril. As a matter of fact, they do they do great stuff. And also the Issa Foundation like really doing tremendous, tremendous things. And I sometimes I wonder, like, where would Negril be? Where would Jamaica be without organizations like, like those? And I have to I have to say Sandals also. Sandals yeah, yes. yeah. Sandals it's Foundations. Sandals. Yep. They built an absolutely gorgeous school on the West End for infant children. Yep. Uh, a whole school. You, can, you can't negate stuff like that. Right. That's futures. They invested in futures. They invested in the children. Yeah. And they constantly are doing just these different projects every time that there is uh, like like Mother's Day and like they're recognizing mm -hmm. their mothers that work work for them and they, they give back. And then there's doing so much in education as well. And we've worked with them with our nonprofit organization mm -hmm. and yeah, and uh, all those organizations. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be kind of a part of a, a, a group like that and knowing that there are other like-minded organizations like like ours to work together and to really build out our community and focus on the future of our community more than anything else. Now, going back to our last conversation and the last sit down that we had, what has been happening or has happened after that, after our first sit down? Well, Capital Look at Casual has continued to grow and you're kind of responsible for that <laughs> because uh, actually one of my one of my moderators asked the other day, uh, what's this engagement that you keep hounding into us, Misty? What's the engagement, 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 engagement? And I said, well, you have to look at your engagement because that's what Facebook looks at and that's what helps your group to grow. And I said, um, let's do, let's do an experiment. Let's just put a post out and ask the members where did they find us? How did they find us? I guarantee you at least six out of 10 people said from the interview with Thorpe. Oh, wow. That's mm -hmm. awesome. <laughs> That's I so saw awesome. you on this interview with that guy on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the beard. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's great. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, but I, I know you've done, you've actually started another group on yes. Facebook, uh, post, post our conversation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, it's called Black Expats in the Grill. And the um, expat movement among African Americans, Black Canadians, people from all over the world is really growing. And they're looking for that place. Now, of course, there's no Nirvana and no, no Wakanda and no, <laughs> and no perfect place. But they're looking for certain things. And I feel that Jamaica gets overlooked because of what they say. Mm -hmm. They're listening to what they say. And um, there are many of us living here extremely happy. And this is not a Snickers bar. This is not something that you enjoy. You keep it to yourself and you don't tell the rest of mm -hmm. the world. You want, you want to share it. At least I do. I want to share it with my brothers and sisters. Because I have found, a few, okay, so let's look at the things that would make Jamaica, um, and I'll just speak from an Afri African American's perspective, what would make Jamaica a great choice. It's a 98.7%, I believe, black country. It's English speaking. It's not that far from America. So suppose you left, uh, like in my case, I left a 95-year-old uncle back home that I needed to get to quickly in case of some disastrous emergency 
So family, friends, and grandchildren, you know, you've left them back home. You want to be able to fluidly move back and forth between countries. That's easy. Um, there is peace and happiness here, despite what you may hear. What you uh, have to do, you look at that level three. Th I'll just speak. I'll just speak on it. The level three threat warning by the United States of America. And I'm wondering how they can really caution anybody about violence and crime, but I digress. <laughs> um, look at the areas that they told you were the hot spots where this is happening. Like in any country, in, we'll take Memphis, for example, where I'm from, there are certain parts of Memphis you wouldn't want to venture to late at night. It's common sense. So you would not natu naturally want to maybe locate in those particular spots. I submit to you that I think the grill is a very good place to, to locate. I am here. I've been here for 13 years. I like me a whole lot. I don't want anything to happen to me. I love me. So I'm not going to put me in danger, and I'm not going to ask other people to come join me in danger because I feel like this is a relatively safe place. Mm -hmm. um, if one uses their common sense and follows certain protocols, that you would do at home. Your mother told you, watch watch where you go. Your mother told you, watch who you run with, who you associate with. Your mother told you to stay out of trouble. So why can't you do that in a foreign country mm -hmm. and live happily? So I, I just feel that this is a good place to be. Um, another thing I have to overcome in convincing people that the grill is a good place to locate is the spirit that is strictly a party town and a vacation spot. Well, how would you like to live on a vacation? I have a t-shirt, I love this t-shirt. It says, I live where you like to vacation. <laughs> and uh, when I wore it and took pictures and put it on my Facebook page, all my friends were so mad at me. <laughs> but it's the truth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here I have the famous Seven Mile Beach, I have some of the top entertainers that come in town to do shows from time to time. If I choose to party, there's something going on any night, any night of the week, and I can go or not. I can stay home. And then I I have lots of company coming. I'm never never lonely. People love to come here, visit you, come, go. Um, you can meet lots of people from all over the world. You can go hang out on the beach and just have conversation with folks and you know hang out of your travelers hang out at the bar meet some people you're never lonely so if you're single like me and you and you're here you can always find something to do and something to entertain yourself i didn't see myself in jamaica stuck in the top of the blue mountains in a cabin all alone i saw myself in a social setting that's in the grill that's how that's how i decided to be here I don't live on the beach. That's, oh, my God. Why everybody wants me to find them a house on the beach. I can't do that, people. <laughs> there are not houses on the beach here. You, know? <laughs> you, you live off of the beach. You come visit the beach. Yeah, you, you, you said a lot, <laughs> and I want to unpack some, of, some okay. of what you just said. And to start with, it's the, the level three threat level okay. that we were at by the U.S., put Jamaica at as a whole. Have you had inquiries or concerns that came to your doorstep when this was put out? Yes. Um, the people at, some people actually canceled their vacations. Really? And some people, um, you know, because we do have the group, the uh, Capital of Casual, there were people who got on there and asked, have you seen the threat? That, that threat has been issued, downgraded, reissued several times. Uh, one of the things that raised the level this time is the all-inclusives mm. finally had to be held accountable for crimes that happened on their property, which heretofore had not been reported. And that sort of raised things a little bit. And, yes, there are things going on. Um, if I may venture to, to say something, I did my re my homework. 79% of the crime in Jamaica, the entire country, is criminal on criminal activity. Now, we don't want to uh, sugarcoat anything when it comes to crime. 
But these are the um, guys handling what they feel is their business. Now, if you're not in that circle and you're not a part of that world and you're not engaging in that, it's probably 99% of the time not going to touch you. The next big chunk, and I don't have a percentage for this for you, but anybody who's familiar with Jamaica knows that, unfortunately, domestic violence is, is a little bit high. Um, this, these are couples that, for whatever reason, can't reconcile their differences in a court of law, but they handle it another way. And that's another huge part that's going to leave us with a very small percentage for that crime that people envision. I'm an innocent person, and I don't have anything to do with this, and somebody's coming for me. That percentage is very small. Now, if it's your person, I got in trouble about this the first time on our first interview. If that person in that small percentage is someone you love, then that percentage is huge. I certainly understand that. Um, one person in the comments from that first interview was devastated because of their situation, and I would be too. But I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and right now Memphis is number three in the whole country of the United States of America for crime and violence. Okay. All right. When I go home, when I have to go back there for any reason, medical checkups, et cetera, I am frightened the whole time I'm there. I'm not frightened in the grill. Mm. I'm comfortable here. But I don't go walking for exercise there. I don't. I'm afraid to go pump gas. I'm afraid to go to the bank. I'm afraid to go to the grocery store wow. there. This is honest truth. I can only speak for myself. Everybody who's listening, please understand that I do have the right to speak for myself. I'm not making a universal statement for anybody else or telling people this is the way things are, period. I am saying that I am more comfortable in the grill Jamaica than I am in Memphis, Tennessee. At least on, on my podcast and the live streams that I do, like mm -hmm. I never sugarcoat the challenges that Jamaica is having, having with mm -hmm. crime and violence like it exists. But like you said, it's not... I don't look at Jamaica as a place where randomized crimes happen or I'm fearful of going about my business on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. and I'm looking over my shoulder. And I also think, like you said, where you were talking about lessons our mothers gave us about be careful of the company you keep. It's the same thing. Absolutely. And, you know, you're going to attract certain elements and certain things if you hang out with certain people and that goes for anywhere in the world that's universal mm -hmm. when i think of other vacation places if you will or even places that i've been around the world where i've been i'm not going to name names of countries or cities <laughs> or anything like that but i was extensively warned about doing the simplest of things right. and not to go out after a certain time and all these things that were really real because randomized crimes are a norm of those societies and of those towns. And I thankfully knock on wood, that's not really the situation here. However, like you said, there are things happen. You know, we're, we're, we're speaking generally and we're speaking uh, from a st statistical standpoint, but there are in turn people who are going to be affected or have been affected by that. And we don't want to discount that in any way or not recognize them. And it is tragedy and, and anything. And I could say this now and something can happen to me tomorrow. Right? right. And, but it's, it's a possibility. Yes. But the likelihood in my experience of being here, man, crazy. I can't even imagine this, but like I've been here 18 years now and I've had a, a fairly good go at it, you know, thankfully knock on wood again. Um, and that has been my experience. So since we're on the, the crime issue, this, I got eaten alive for this one on the mm -hmm. first interview. So maybe we could talk about this a little bit. Um, I specifically spoke about crimes against returnees and, 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 and uh, expats. That percentage is so infinitesimally small 
that it almost doesn't register on the radar. Mm -hmm. Almost, I said, almost. Okay. Because I believe at the time there was something happened to, I believe, if I'm getting this right, a couple in Mandeville and mm -hmm. around that area and then around that time period, I should say. And that's how we started engaging in this conversation. Right. Um, if you want to, if you want to be completely fair and honest to Jamaica, which I will be, I'm going to be that person. You have to take the whole of everyone who has repatriated to this country, all of the thousands of Jamaicans who went elsewhere, earned a living, and then came back here to build and, and live in, happily in, in, in their country for the rest of their lives. That number is vast. you got to take nationwide all of those people, including myself, who are living happily and safely, and then look at the, if I'm not wrong, something to the area of 10 to 15 of those types of crabs that have happened over the past, I've been here 13 years, 13 years. And it doesn't even make mathematical sense. Again, I state, if your family loved one was one of those persons, it's not a small thing to you, okay? But it is not a number so vast that this constant, oh, don't go back there. If you go back, they're going to kill you. They're going to follow you from the airport and they're going to murder you. That How many times have I heard that? Mm -hmm. You know, They think you're rich. They think everybody's rich. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from foreign, not just returnees. Right. You know, so um, it just it just it doesn't make logical sense for people to dissuade people from coming back to their beautiful country to live because of this idea that they're going to be a victim of crime, mm -hmm. a serious crime. And I tell people specifically that demographic of Jamaicans returning to Jamaica to their homeland where they were born. And then also even folks who are considering moving and retiring here mm -hmm. that are not Jamaican is like, don't allow that, these headlines that happen, don't allow that to strike so much fear in you. That and you thought, don't do it. Yep. I, I hope the cleaner and the observer will forgive me, but I have noticed that when one of those incidents does happen, they really love to splash it. Um, I think day before yesterday, an American mm -hmm. um, girl was found dead in her hotel room. Oh, wow. I didn't even hear about that. Um, and I really don't know what happened to her yet, but it was splashed. Mm -hmm. You know, because all you have to do is be from foreign and let something happen to you here. And it's a huge deal. It's even bigger news than, say, if something happened the same day, the same way to a native Jamaican, mm -hmm. that one is blown up bigger because the, the press buys into that. And it's, it's sensationalism. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's sensational. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at what happened to that person from Canada here. Oh, look at what happened for that person from the United States or Spain or Mexico in Jamaica. And um, it's not the number. The numbers don't bear out it being some kind of epidemic um, proportion, huge, huge, huge issue. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, like, with that same, I, like, again, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, this first time I'm hearing about that, the young lady, mm -hmm. um, but the, these things have happened, like you just mentioned, but it's not to the point that I would say, like my opinion, it's not to the point where you should not consider moving here. And like, when I look at what is happening in Jamaica, f certainly from the standpoint of, of real estate and real estate development and just in general, the direction that the country is heading in, like we're on an upward trajectory like I've never seen or felt before. And do not miss out on that. And I, and I truly, truly believe this. I truly believe that we are, the future for Jamaica is extremely bright. And I think that if this is a place that you consider home for yourself and this is a place where you were born and grown and you went to foreign and you're thinking about coming back and this is where you're comfortable 
consider it. I mean, highly consider it. Don't allow, again, these headlines to say, I would never go to Jamaica. They're going to, they're going to, this, that, and the third is going to happen to me. Look into it. Consider it. Reach out to groups like Capital Casual, Black Expats in Negril. Mm -hmm. Talk to people who are living it. Talk to people who have been here since 2000, you said? You've been here? Well, that's when I first visited. Okay. But I've, I've been... Um living here 13 years. 13 years i've been here 18 years um there are so many other expats who've been here longer than both of us and i'd say that that is probably one of the, the great steps to figuring out whether this is really for you or not and you mentioned all these wonderful things specifically about living in the grill and being here and the ease at which you move around mentally mm -hmm. and why miss out on that? Why why miss out on that because of reading something that's in the newspaper? I'm currently having some health issues. Mm -hmm. my, my doctor back in the States uh, tells me after the checkups, go back to Jamaica. Something's happening over there that's keeping you going. Wow. That's, that's making these numbers look better. That's mm -hmm. making this thing better. Go back. And, and I just go every six months, get my little checkup, and he he puts me, when are you going When are you going back? I said, and I told him tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. <laughs> he said, good, go on and go. I also, also add that, um, I think I spoke to you about this earlier, specifically to African Americans. We have some African American expats here who are doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. They are doing extremely well. Uh, we we are we are thriving here, and if you have a head for business, and some capital, and a good business plan, and you want to invest somewhere, uh, you had a big conference about that ThropX. Mm -hmm. um, you had all of these uh, this think tank with all of these movers and shakers, and took them around and showed them some opportunities. Um, right now, Travel Noir magazine has voted. The Grill Treehouse as one of the the most beautiful black owned hotels in the entire world. Amazing. Amazing. In the entire world. And she's from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And um she's been thriving here. Jackie's on the reef, one of the most exotic spiritual massage Zen Buddha yoga places in the world. Oprah Winfrey loved it. Um, Jackie Lewis from New York, Deborah Barrett from California, two locations of the Negril Soap Factory. She makes her um, handmade soaps and cannabis thingies, you know. Mm -hmm, yep. And she's, you know, and we're and we're doing well here. And a lot of a lot of people are now getting uh, larger homes and investing in Airbnb. I can think of a couple from Atlanta, Georgia, that just finished their place and. The list goes on. Now, I don't want to do anything. I'm retired. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. But those of you that still want to come and do something and try to make some money, you'd be surprised in the grill is a lucrative little spot that you should try out. I can't agree with you more. Mm -hmm. And if you were to recommend to somebody a type of business to start in the grill, what would it be? I got it for you. I'm so glad you asked me that question. You know what? If somebody would make uh, start a laundromat, on the beach road, get about five or six or seven or eight machine washing machines and dryers. Hire an attendant. I'd put a bar in there too. I'd put a bar. Yeah. I'd put in a bar, and then I would buy the uh, washing products in bulk and put them in smaller containers and have them there on the shelf for people to buy to do to do their laundry. And the attendant is there to be sure nobody overloads the machines and tries to do everybody's laundry in the neighborhood on, on their one dollar fifty cents whatever <laughs> and uh that that it has to be on the beach road though because we have laundry services but they're all spread out on the west end and in the bus park and everything but the beach road is where the tourists are mm -hmm. and those canadians specifically they love to come for two and three months because it's cold back in canada right they could, co could go do their laundry it would be a hit I thought about the storage facility when it was, when there wasn't a th uh, there wasn't one, and now there's a storage facility. This guy started one in, in uh, Warwick, Fish. I thought about the Tiki Pond to Sea before Tiki Pond to Sea became Tiki Pond to Sea. 
and now it's here. Mm-hmm. I have all these business ideas. I don't want to do a thing now. I don't want to work. Hello, I don't want to work. <laughs> Misty does not want to work. I'll just give you the idea and you do it. <laughs> I'll say, I think the laundry idea is phenomenal. Yeah. I spoke about this mm-hmm. on a recent live stream and I actually wrote a business plan for a laundry mat. This is probably almost 10 years ago. Yeah. And I took it a little bit of a step further and also including commercial laundry because there are some, uh, particularly large hotels, they outsource their laundry to this laundry facility in Ochi. But you know, it's one on the West End. Right. No. So this, I haven't been to this facility, mm-hmm. but it's a commercial laundry facility that's in Ocho Rios. Okay. And they send the laundry all the way from Negril to Ochi. Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding. And so I'm like. Are you listening, people? <laughs> There's a business opportunity. There is like, you would print money. Uh-huh. You would literally pour, plant money in the ground and the tree would come and money would come off of it because it's so needed. So you have, like you said, the residential aspect mm-hmm. where you can, you're supplying people who are staying for, like you said, extended periods of time, maybe even do delivery as well. They pick up, comes back folded. Uh, I know that's big in New York, but then on the commercial side, I mean, it's, it'd be, I forget how many millions of dollars of the investment that you would have to do, need because one of the biggest expenses, especially now, water has become so expensive. It's almost rivaling uh, JPS, uh, electricity. Uh. And so you'd have to have a plan, a water harvesting plan in place mm-hmm. and then also even a solar plan in place. But once you do that, forget about it. Like you are going to be off to the races and the way i had it it's it's all logistics that's it like once you do the math i think it would i think it would be great the grill needs a true recycling plant that can recycle plastic and recycle um um, i guess what uh, cardboard paper all of those things yep uh for a a for-profit recycling plant would would work well here and uh i don't even know if jamaica has one of the big machines that crushes things like old cars and stuff that be, because the old washing machine. Right. Because that, that would solve two big problems. You could sell the scrap metal and it would help uh, eliminate all of these things being thrown out on the roadside for trash Yeah. because there's no place to, to take them. Yeah. I think that would be, Great idea. Great idea. And you're, you're solving two problems right there right. with one stone, so to speak. If you went into a private, if you could get the garbage trucks over here and go and start a secondary private garbage collection company, that would go over well here also. Yes. Because garbage collection is not done properly. Yeah. You go into the garbage collection business here, you probably going to make some money. Yeah. And <laughs> like you, like we're, we're talking about these challenges that we're having as a community mm-hmm. and both of us are thinking like these challenges are huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if, like you said, if somebody has maybe this experience already, they can bring that here and you would do so well and the community would thank you by supporting you with these different types of business ideas. I think you're, you're, you're spot on with that. In respect to, uh, going back to the black expats group, what, I would say, what? Why did you start that group? Like, oh. where did that come from? Okay, true, true, true. Confessions. I was on the beach at Treehouse, um, January the fifth of this past year. It literally dropped out the palm tree onto my head. I was just thinking how happy I was, and uh, I had a friend with me that day, and she was chattering away on the beach chair beside me, and I, she was talking, but I wasn't listening to her being honest I wasn't listening to her my mind was someplace else and I started thinking about what if I was thinking about all these there are so many black expat groups out there on the internet right now there's blacks at tribe there's 60 women active over over black black expats there's black mexpats for people who want to go to Mexico I was thinking about this lady who's pushing um they're, they're pushing Portugal they're pushing, uh, oh, they're pushing Panama. Panama, oh, Panama is booming. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know that. And, but, and, and I, just, I just sort of felt a little bit some kind of way, as people mm-hmm. say. I'm saying, nobody pushes Jamaica. But I'm here and I'm happy. And I literally throw, I'm telling you the truth, I picked up my phone. And do you have a, everybody has a button. 
create group. Mm -hmm. And I punched it and I named it and I started loading onto, and my girlfriend's still over here talking. <laughs> She's talking. I, I, lo I started doing profiles of all the beautiful women, Orbra Harold, Gail Biggs, Jackson Bruce, Jackie Lewis, um, oh my goodness, uh, Iris Inley, and I just started doing profiles of all of them and telling their story because I felt that was the way to start. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to show you these marvelous women that are here thriving and doing well. You won't be alone, so pack your things and come. We'll help you. We'll mm -hmm. help you get settled. We'll, we'll tell you how to go to the Cambio and change money and go to Digicel and get a phone chip and make your phone operable and how to call, get Flo to come over and put your internet in. And You know, I've been actually doing this the past few months wow. since January. I have a young lady that's moved next door to me right now and another one on the way July the 15th and another young lady coming in September who's already gotten her permanent residency. I'll help people walk them through their permanent residency because I've done it and it's a journey. But I step by step help you walk through it because all you need is just to reach out to somebody and help them. You know, help them because they're, they're coming to a strange country. They don't know anyone. And this is all happening through this group? Yes. Wow. I mean, that is so powerful to have an already established community yes. that is there to help you. Yes. That you can automatically, directly relate to immediately. Right. And to that end, I have to put in a little plug for my little young'uns. Black Exodus living local in Jamaica. That group started two months after mine. Okay. And they had their first meet and greet last night at Kenny's Italian Cafe. And 50 of them showed up. Wow. Which was wonderful. And they're already actually, they. I was mistaken. I thought these were hopefuls, but these are actually people that already live here. Really? And they, they travel from St. Mary, St. Anne's, Kingston, to come here to see the faces that they had been talking to on the internet. That's so awesome. And there they all were. That's giving me goosebumps. Yeah, and I That's and I was there in the middle of them. You know, they're mostly young people, mm -hmm. and I felt I felt sixteen last night. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're they're doing a great job. They're they're actually still meeting. They're meeting right now. They're up at Treehouse having a luncheon. That's and awesome. I, I told them I'll be I'll be over there after I get through with the interview. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And so, like, this seems like a real movement. It is like, a movement because um, I, I wanted to speak to um, why why black people need black groups anyway. Why do you need a black expats in the grill? Why can't it just be expats in the grill? Why does it have to be black expats in the grill? Because um, we feel disenfranchised in the country we're in already, or else why would you be moving? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not moving for vacation. You're moving, moving. So you want to research and reach out, and it does it does help to have that welcoming hand and that person who can relate to you who's been there. And I think as I look at all the black, and I'm on a lot of those black expat groups because I do research for mine, mm -hmm. the number one question is they want to know will they be welcome? Well, what, what is the racism, racism picture like? in country XYZ. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's negligible in Jamaica. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> that's, you know, yeah. I, I, I've spoken to a many in Jamaica that didn't find out what racism was until they um, went foreign mm. because it, it didn't have to deal with it here. Not much. Yeah. You know, there's no place with no racism. But um, they... They want to be able to talk freely, ask questions, and feel comfortable asking certain questions that might offend other people without having to tiptoe on eggshells and be diplomatic. It's a family gathering, and they can just let it all hang out and go ahead and ask their question and express themselves and many of their frustrations. You know, maybe they went somewhere and it didn't work out. I have a lady now who... Uh, went to Portugal, and she wrote me the other day and said, I'm coming to Jamaica because of what I've read on your group. Hmm. I'm changing. I'm changing gears. So she was living in Portugal? She's living in Portugal. And she said? And she's coming to Jamaica now. Wow. Next month. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. But we have to have spaces in which we can feel free to talk our way about our stuff Mm -hmm. and our heartbreak and our problems and our issues without fear of judgment. So that's why black expat groups exist. And that's why we exclusively have them on the internet. Extremely, extremely important group Mm -hmm. to have. And when, when did you start seeing this happen? Like this, this movement, because it's, it's, it's become larger and I have my own thinking with this, but, but it's larger than I initially thought it was. And then of course, with the content that I put out as well, it's, it's very much aligned with that. But I would say, when did you start seeing this movement start to happen? And then also you kind of alluded to this earlier with your, with your, with your previous answer, but why do you think it's happening? Okay. Um, I don't have a timeline. I know I started to notice them within the past 10 years. I started to notice these groups popping up. I first noticed Black Travel Movement, Re- Reggie Cummings, and it was, um, it's, it, oh my God, it's, it's tremendous. I think he's got like 1.5 million members or something like oh, wow. that. And, um, and then they started planning these trips, you know, all black trips, you know, black takeover this, takeover the Black Yard Week. In Croatia, I didn't even know there was a Black Yacht Week in Croatia. But <laughs> they, you know, they go to all of these things, and sort of out of the traveling, the idea popped up of, hmm, wonder could we just move? Because um, clearly, in many places in the United States, we're just not wanted. Mm. You, you, we're just not, and I guess that. You only have one life to live, and you'd like a, a small portion of it at least to be happy and to be able to breathe. And so these expat movements popped up, and, and we're creating new communities elsewhere. We're creating new communities where we can circle the wagons and be together and just be happy. Somebody deserves to be happy some part of their lives. And these movements have all come from come from the traveling, and it's now evolved into, let's take it to the next level. Um, Ghana, for example, three years ago had the year of return. They reached out to the African-American community and said, give us back our people you took. Mm-hmm. And they will, Ghana will fast track you through um, citizenship and permanent residency and offer you some land. So everybody's getting brave enough now. They're getting, they're getting brave. They're getting that feeling of being able to do something else other than the familiar, especially with the help of people who are already there who will reach out to you and help you. So um, you asked me about man specifically, right? I'm sorry, I asked you about... You asked, you asked me about my group specifically no just um, in general yeah. i would say just because it's you you mentioned several different groups you mentioned also groups that are not even affiliated with jamaica but no. these expat groups no. and it seems like a very much a global phenomenon that's that's happening and, and then it's called black sitting b-l-a-x-i-t-i-n-g there you black go. exiting mm-hmm. now that might make a lot of people happy But guess what? It's going to make us happy, too, (laughs) because we're going somewhere where we're going to be happy. -er. (laughs) Right, right. And and, uh, I tell a lot of my my young folks, I say, listen, you can't fail. Because if you go to, we'll just take Panama. And it doesn't suit you. You're not, nobody's going to hold you prisoner there. Do some more research. Try a different country. Mm Mm-hmm. I have a young lady in town right now, and she's she's been very upfront with me. She said, I don't know if Jamaica is going to be it for me. I'm going to give it three months, and I'm going to see. She said, but I guarantee you this. I will not be going back to the United States of America. Hmm. She's going somewhere else, but she is not going back to the United States of America. And that's what I also tell people who are like, 
kind of, and I understand they get hung up on like, where in Jamaica should I live and where should I start? And I just tell them, oh, wonderful. (laughs) But then you also have like different elements, right? You have the city life of Kingston. You kind of have the middle ground of Montego Bay when you when you compare it to Negril and Kingston mm-hmm. and people get hung up on that, which again, I understand, mm-hmm. but it's also, like you said, it's just like you spend a month or two in Kingston and you're like, ah, I don't know if this is going to be for me. Right. Come over to Negril and, and check it out. Go to Treasure Beach and check it out and spend some time right, there, right. especially I would so say like, all right, if you're retired, you probably have a lot more flexibility, but mm-hmm. also if you're a digital nomad, that's fine as well. And don't necessarily, unless you've already done your research extensively, but you don't necessarily need to buy a home without having dip your toe in the water of like understanding uh, what it's like to live in Treasure Beach or Negril or Kingston or St. Thomas or wherever it is. And just keep in mind, you have that flexibility and you're not tied down and you don't have to do that. Just like you said, this person is not liking Portugal, so she's going to come to Jamaica. And same thing with a person, that young lady you're saying who's in Kingston, that's going to give it three more months. You can try somewhere else. So I just want to remind people of that, that you do have that flexibility. Absolutely. And I'd like to remind people that um, you said buy a home. Um, In my case, and, and the other young lady, she followed my advice. We kept our investment in the United States. We didn't sell our home. My home is rented out. Her home is rented out. The rent money from that is paying my rent over here. So I am still living free, so to speak. But I get to keep my investment that I paid for in the U.S., which is appreciating in value. Um, I don't mind telling you about the house. It was $125,000 back in 1987. Right now, um, I got an offer for $280,000. And I'm not saying that it's going to keep going up, keep going up, but I plan to hold on to it. I plan to hold on to it. And I am, um, I'm using the money from that rental to pay my rent over here. That way, if you don't buy a house and tie yourself down to one part of Jamaica, you could move around if you wanted to. But once you decide, okay, I'm going to build in St. Elizabeth. Mm Mm-hmm. You're kind of stuck in St. Elizabeth. Right. So if you think of another way of doing it, because this remember now, this is the frolicking part of your life. This is the fun part. You did all of that solid stuff over there. That's, that's why you have a house. You did the work, bought the house, paid for it. You know. So now it's time to just have fun. So you could stay in Airbnbs if you wanted to or just rent or whatever or rent, rent a nice little house for a couple of years and then go over to Portland and go over there for a while. You just have fun. And I know that that's one of like the main questions that people are trying to understand before moving to Jamaica, probably anywhere, is how are they going to afford this lifestyle, whether it's they're in their retirement, are they still working? And there are creative ways of, of doing this. And I think that's one of them. And I, I also encourage people to open their minds to different ways of earning and earning an income and use your experience and status in the country that you may be moving from. Well, sugar, I was born in 1951. There was no such thing as remote work. There you go. You took yourself to a office, a physical facility and you slaved for eight hours. These young people today, they have an option of finding work with an American company on American salary levels. And if they can get a good internet connection, they can work from just about anywhere. So that's, that's huge. Mm-hmm. That's one of the biggest things I would say. Um, another option is if you get employed by an American company that happens to have a branch here in Jamaica, which is probably going to be in Kingston, Mm -hmm. but you could get transferred to that facility from America and you still are earning that American money again, I would say. The other option I would think would be, I I wouldn't say that people could get employed here in a Jamaican sense because um, 
the salaries are lower than they're ex than they're experiencing. They have to have some unique skill that a Jamaican person would not be able to fulfill because Jamaica gets it right. Jamaica puts Jamaicans first. And you have to literally prove that you have something to offer that a Jamaican person can't in order to get said job. So we not even think about jobs in a traditional job sense as a foreigner coming over here, I don't think. Am I right or wrong? I was gonna say that's an excellent <laughs> point and like that is what it is. And I've, in my experience, like a lot of Europeans try to come over here uh, and, and, the, and, when, and I'm not trying to put them in any sort mm -hmm. of negative category, negative light, but, and these are my friends, then they've tried to come here and just get regular jobs and it just doesn't work out. And I tell them like, no, like you don't want to do that. And then on top of that, you're taking a job from a Jamaican instead of like using, like you said, a unique skill set that you have that may not exist here and adding value to the community. And and I think if you're going to do something like that, it's kind of going back to what we said earlier, go the entrepreneurial route, bring value to the community, start a business, employ individuals here, bring a service or a product that doesn't exist here that mm -hmm. we need and we would like and we will support you. I think that's also uh, another very realistic, viable option that you can do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel... Jamaica Negril is still affordable for people to move here. Oh yes, yes. Um, I get the question all the time. What do I think is the uh, economic level to do okay here? I say, and I could be all wit. If you have an income of of three thousand U.S. dollars a month, I think you could be fine here. You can find rents anywhere from a low of four hundred a month to up to 2000 something a month, depending on what amenities you want and location. Americans, uh, number one thing I usually hear is I have to have air conditioning. Air conditioning is a big ticket item here. Air conditioning, we're, we're accustomed to sitting up in the house in the AC all day long, running the AC. JPS comes, come see you, <laughs> you know. I think the idea of being here is to have a home base and get out and about and do things. Jamaicans don't stay stuck up in the house all day. They're out doing stuff, you know. Come home at night, have dinner, go to bed. That's what the house is for. Um, I've heard Americans say they have to have a dishwasher. They have to have a washer and dryer. I don't know anybody with a dishwasher. I can't think of one person in Jamaica that has a dish. There's I'm sure they do. Oh, no, that's not true. I do. I do I, have a friend. Yes, I, I do. I think yeah, the yeah. Aqueduct <laughs> has dishwashers. And, oh, really? And I, okay. And I think uh, Little Bay Country Club. Okay. Yeah, I believe they have, you know. But, um, yeah, and, you know, the washer and the dryer, so the, you know, you want a dryer. But, see, I have a washing machine. But mm -hmm. my, my clothes are lying hung to dry. Yep. Um, Same. Yeah. And, um Know, it's some adjustments that you can make that would make life more affordable. But if you want the Cadillac, you want all the bells and whistles, internet, cable, uh, dishwasher, dryer, AC, yeah, you're looking at 1500 2000 a month. For rent? Yeah. Okay, for rent and in including all that. Right. I think that's a good, gives people a good idea of of what that's, what you get for that. And with this three thousand dollar budget a month that you that you stated earlier, what is your your life like? What is your day to day like? What is your 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 social My gathering? Day to day? Oh. oh, just in, <laughs> like on that on that budget, and then yeah, speak personally as well, please. Okay, to me, honestly, um, I have I have designed my life because I love my internet's uh, social influencing position. I, I do not get paid for it. I don't want to because I don't want to earn money in Jamaica. I don't want to be involved with the Jamaican government and the tax man, period. I am a retiree. I do what I do for free. So I spend copious amounts of hours just talking to people on the Internet. And I like it. I do it. I'm at home. I'm cool. I'm relaxed. I'm on my, up under my fan and I do my internet. I do my internet. Um, even if I go to the beach, 
I'm going to have that phone with me. <laughs> and I'm checking in on Capital of Casual, Black X in the Grill, about every hour or so to be sure that nobody's cussing nobody out. Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, I go out with friends. I go and meet people. I have so many group members who I'm coming to town. I want to meet you. And I socialize a lot. I socialize a lot more than I would if I was in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I would just be sitting in my house staring at the four walls. (laughs) Over here, I have a life. I exercise every morning. You know, you see me, I see you. Mm -hmm. I get up, I have my exercise, walk my dog, have a good breakfast. Sometimes I go out to eat. Sometimes I cook. I have a nice, peaceful, quiet life that I've designed that fits me. At a given drop of a hat, I will hire a driver and go anywhere in this island 360. One thing I've learned to do is go stay in a luxury hotel for a couple of days to just treat myself. Absolutely. And get pampered and spoiled. And then come on back on to my house. I can do that. It's a good jumping off base even to travel to other places. You can go back over to Florida and you can go here, there, and come on back home to the grill. Um, I have a great life. I'm very, very happy with it. It sounds like a beautiful life. It sounds like a life that many, many would love to have and to aspire to. And that's awesome that you've been able to create that for yourself. Earlier, you were talking about the the permanent residency and Mm -hmm. you were helping people go through that process. And I know that's a big hurdle for many who've kind of just set their mind and say, Hey, I want to, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. Can you just kind of get a, just a little bit touch on that? Like what that process is like. Okay. You bring, um, certain documents over from the United States with you. When you've made up your mind, you want to do this. You're going to need, uh, some financials, a copy, a sealed and unopened copy of your police record from the state you lived in the longest that you currently live in. And, um, some passport photos uh, in the case of a woman like myself who's married and divorced, bring your marriage license, bring your divorce decree because you're going to have to explain why your name is different than on your birth certificate. Of course, your birth certificate and an official copy, not one that you did on Xerox at Kinko's. They want an official stamp copy. All documents must be originals and they cannot be more than six months old that you bring, like your bank statements and things like that. And you come over here, and you um, and you're gonna get a little doctor's a little doctor's uh, visit from a doctor here in Jamaica, and get a health certificate, um, an interview. Of course, the money is roughly six hundred fifty dollars now, I believe. U.S. Uh, yeah, it's U.S., but you have to take it in Jamaican dollars that day. Gotcha. And you have two options now. You didn't have two options when I did it. You can. You can go to Montego Bay and do all of this. I had to go all the way to Kingston. Um, some people still recommend going to Kingston because they're going to send your documents from Montego Bay to Kingston anyway. Gotcha. And a lot of people don't like their documents in transit, so they just go to Kingston. And then you have a, a interview, a home visit. They come. They physically come to your house and walk through your house to be sure that you are, in fact, living there. And then you just wait, and it takes about four months from start to finish. And I don't know anybody personally who got turned down. Most people, if they follow the protocols, they, 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 get, they get through successfully. And it's good for 10 years as long as your passport is uh, ready for renewal. Mm-hmm. And then when you, if you have to go get your passport renewed, you take it back and they put the stamp in, in your new one. And you can just keep doing that for as long as you're living and be a resident of Jamaica. You come and go like a Jamaican. Nobody's counting your days anymore. You, the, only, the only requirement is that you must touch Jamaican soil once a year. Oh, boo-hoo, I have to come to Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great, great. Thank you. I, I've never, I, I didn't, I don't know that mm-hmm. step. So I didn't know this process. So thank you for that. I think that was an education uh, for me as well. And I get that question a lot and I just redirect people. I made it sound simple, but um, it's, it's my experience that 
the personnel will they're gonna throw one monkey wrench in your works during your process. It's something it's something different with everybody. I have a theory about that. I think that they're trying to see if you're gonna lose it. <laughs> if you go like Or go, maybe <laughs> if you <laughs> to see if you really want it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They they wanna see if you're gonna go bonkers. <laughs> you know, or if you can keep it together. Yeah. And my my uh, coach that, that walked me through it said, I don't care what they do I don't care what they say you smile and you say yes ma'am now how can I remedy that situation or what do you need me to do Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) that's the best way to do it honey instead of vinegar right Mm -hmm. earlier you have mentioned also that you're 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 a single person Mm -hmm. living here in Jamaica and I know a lot of people want to understand and maybe open their minds to to dating here and um you mentioned that that group uh that you were with last night it was a lot of young people and i get my audience is more of a mature audience and they are looking to understand what it is like to to date here in jamaica and my question to you is what kind of advice would you give people who are looking possibly to date here okay if you look at the statistics Worldwide, it's you know in the United States. Bottom line, there are more women than men. It's uh you know they love to quote things like in Atlanta it's twelve women to every one man, or <laughs> or in D.C. I think D.C. is horrible. Uh, you know, okay, so let's come to Jamaica. Uh, if you look at the births, it's the same. There are more females than males. So let's start from that base, okay, and. Jamaican women are just absolutely gorgeous. They just are. And they can cook. And they can dance. <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and and um, here you are coming from foreign. So how do you break into that dating pool? Um, first of all, I would say the dating scene might be better in somewhere like Kingston or somewhere like... Uh, Montego Bay, even, you know. But um, I would say here in in the grill, for example, I think that most people, especially by my age, are already coupled up, um, taken, mm-hmm. so to speak. So that pool is so tiny yeah. that... It would just be a sheer stroke of luck, I think, for you and someone who is available to find each other. Um, don't want to paint paint too dismal a picture of the dating situation, but I think I'm I think I'm pretty much spot on. Mm-hmm. Uh, as for me personally, um, it's no longer something that I look for personally because I've designed this little life that suits me. And I, I'm kind of out of the cooking, cleaning, <laughs> uh, pleasing game. I hear you. I hear <laughs> so, you. So um, I say young people would have a, a better chance of dating. Uh, I think that a lot of people, uh, gentlemen here, they're working. They're, they're working. They're hustling. They're they're. Um, their leisure time to spend time with you dating is going to be also very small. I, it's my observation. Am I right or wrong? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> they are hardworking people on both sides. On yeah. both sides. But yeah. Men and women for sure. Um, but definitely the dudes, they are definitely hustling out here. Many of them with multiple jobs, as a matter of fact, yeah. trying, trying to make it work. Um, what about... What about amongst other expats? Is that also a viable I don't, option? I, I think if you look at any expat group, you're going to find that, once again, it's more women. More women. Okay. More women. Um, and male expats are, from that I've observed, are very rare. Mm. I have, even if you look at my newly formed group, 1,200 people. I say out of that thousand two hundred, I bet you it's maybe two hundred, no, maybe a hundred men. So that I, I wasn't going <laughs> to ask this question, but like I was going to ask my last question, but this actually mm-hmm. brings up a, something I've been pondering, 
And I agree with you that there are more female expats than male expats. Why do you think that is? I think that um, men who are part of a couple, uh, they, their wife and their life is, is settled in the, in the country they're in. It's, they're settled. Mm-hmm. They um, are happy where they are because maybe they found their happiness in each other. But that single female, she hasn't found happiness there. And it's not that she's going to another country to hunt men. Absolutely not. I think they're just going to find some modicum of happiness. But um, on the expat sites that I have been on, I do see people ask that question, what's the dating scene like? Um, you One thing at some of the locations that that the black women are going to, they've got to open their mind up to dating someone of a different culture and a different race. Because you're going to Portugal, you're going to Lisbon, you're, go, you're going to Spain, you're going to France, you're going to all these different places. And so you're, going, you're probably not going to be dating black men. Mm-hmm. So they have opened their minds up to dating on an international level before they even left here. So that's that's something to think about. I just don't, I don't think that it's primary on most people's minds when they're relocating. I don't think dating is probably primary on their minds. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting that it's just, again, I, and I agree with you, I don't think it's necessarily being driven by dating, but it's just, it's just more females like who are, who are trying to move to, move to Jamaica are, even driving it sometimes, even if they are part of uh, mm-hmm. part of a couple. This was my last question. Okay. Uh, what is the best advice that you can give to somebody who is considering moving to Jamaica? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're, we're here. There are three groups that I know of, well, four. There's another one, another new one, brand new one, uh, Montego Bay based ex, expat group, Deidre Baby Doll Ellison, I think is the uh, moderator of that one. Then you got the Black Exodus Living Local group. I don't know if Blacks, Black Expats Repats in Jamaica is still um, active or not, but I know they're there. For consultations, you can ask them questions. And then there's mine, Black Expats in the Grill. Black Expats in the Grill, I have to say this. We will help you get situated somewhere other than the Grill because some of the general questions are pretty universal. I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about real estate in other places and rentals, but you might figure that out yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you need our help and you don't want to be in the Grill, We'll still help you. That's not a problem. So I say reach out to one of the expat groups. Make some connections. Um, I think our prime advice is come and stay. They're going to stamp you for three months. They're going to let you stay three months. So why don't you come and stay your three months and see what you think? And then you could go back, regroup, and come back the next time with all your paperwork to do your permanent residency if you've liked it. And in that three months, I hope you have done some house hunting, you know, to see where you want to be and and maybe rent it somewhere. Because I know a lady here in the grill who bought her property, built the house, and then applied for her permanent residency. I would have been a nervous wreck. <laughs> because what if they said no? Right. And you have all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, she, she got through. Okay. They said yes. Good for her. But... Um, you know, she kind of put to me the cart before the horse. Right. So um, you, you should come, try it out, do an extended visit, make a informed decision as to whether you want to do this or not, and then do all of your paperwork to get your residency. And then five years later, if you wish, you could actually apply for your citizenship. That's the biggie. Well, Missy, this has been absolutely wonderful. Where can people follow you where can they find out more information 
please let us know. Okay. Well, my, on my, my Facebook name is Misty, M-I-S-T-I, Memphis. You can send me a friend request. The two groups are Black Expats in the Grill and Capital of Casual, the Grill, Jamaica. Hopefully we can do this again sometime in the future. Yeah, let's I, see what else I can get into. I'm 71 now. No telling what 73, 74, 75 will hold. There we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs>